Basically, a gender reveal party is when a couple invites family, maybe close friends together, and at that occasion, they reveal the gender of the child that will soon be born. And there are different ways of doing this. Of course, when you have these gender reveal parties, blue would represent the boy and pink would represent the girl. And maybe you have balloons, maybe you have confetti, maybe you have smoke, maybe you have a cake that you cut into and you want to see the interior of the cake. We had a gender reveal party for our children, for Graham and then Savannah, and we had an opportunity to share with friends and share with family, share with the church family, the gender of Graham, who of course is a boy, and then also Savannah, who is a girl. This is the time, I don't know if you can see there, because it's a little bit low, but we cut into the cake, and it was blue cake, which meant we're having a boy. And then with Savannah, of course, we had some balloons, and the balloons came out. It's a girl. We had the balloons in a box. A gender reveal party. How many have ever been to one? Gender reveal party? Few of you. How many have ever hosted one? Anybody out there hosted a gender reveal party? Yes, I see you out there. Do you know that there are folks today that believe a gender reveal party is misguided and even wrong? There are people today that would say you should not have a gender reveal party and you should not attend a gender reveal party. Now, for many of us here today, we would say, why? Why would you not want to have a gender reveal party? Why would you feel uncomfortable attending a gender reveal party, and, the, and those people would say, well, we don't know yet the gender of these babies that are to be born. We don't know the gender that they will choose. And so if we have a gender reveal party and we say, it's going to be a boy, it's going to be a girl, they would say, well, you don't know yet because they may grow up and even though biologically we would say they are a male, maybe they would identify as a female. Or maybe they are biologically female, but when they grow up they will identify as a male. Or maybe they will identify as neither. So for you as a parent, or for me as a parent, to have a gender reveal party is to impose on them some restrictions. We are imposing upon them a particular gender, and yet they might choose another gender someday. Now, I don't think you need me to tell you this, but we live in a confusing and complicated age. What we took for granted, what we thought was common sense, what we thought everyone knew, today it is confusing and complicated. We now have boys that will use girls' restrooms and girls that will use boys' restrooms. We now have men who identify as women who are strong, who will play sports against women at times defeat them and get trophies and beat out girls, and yet they're claiming to be a girl, but they have the anatomy and the strength of a man. We live in a confusing and complicated age. But I believe that we have a clear word from God. And so what I want to do today is I want to ask this question. Is gender self-chosen or is it God-given? Which is it? Is it self-chosen or is it God-given? Is gender something I declare in spite of my anatomy, in spite of my birth, in spite of how I was created, that's something I declare. I simply declare I'm a female, or I declare that I'm a male. Is it self-chosen, or is it God-given? Let's see what the Bible has to say about this. So we're going to mainly be today in Genesis chapter 1. Now, we'll be in Genesis chapter 2 some, but we'll mainly be in Genesis chapter 1, and in particular, verses 26 through 28. If you were here, I think it was last Sunday, maybe the Sunday before last, we talked about marriage, marriage and divorce, and when Jesus was asked about that, what did he do? He said, what was it from the beginning? He said, let's go back to creation. Let's go back to the original blueprint 
And that's how we learn how things are to be today. So I want to do the same thing with the idea of gender. So look with me, Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 28. It says, Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Now notice this, male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. This is the creation story. And what we learn from these verses are we are created by God and like God. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later. But we are created by God. I did not create myself. You did not create yourself. You did not choose to be born. Not a one of you pre-birth said, I want to be born. I want to come into this world. And I want to be this or I want to be that. And even in terms of parents, when you came together, you weren't able to dictate or choose what type of child you had, boy or girl. God made that decision. And so we are created by God, but we are also created like God. Three times in this passage, it says we are created in the image of God. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But we are created by God and like God. If you want to understand gender, if you want to understand so much that's complicated in our age today, you have to go back to creation. That's why so much of this is fuzzy today and so much of this is complicated today because we want to discard world created by God. And when you throw out creation, when you throw out the biblical teaching that this world was created by God, there was nothing and then there was something and God is the one who created. Once you throw out creation, anything goes you have to go back to creation. And so as we think today about this passage, again, I want to ask, is gender self-chosen or God-given? Let me share some points that I believe come from this text today. And the first is there are two genders. And I think I could even make a stronger statement. There are only two genders, male and female. Again, right there in verse 27 of of chapter 1, it says, and by the way, you have the word created three times. It's like, you know, God wants you to really hear this. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Did you know it's three times? Doesn't want you to miss it. You are created by God. Male and female he created them. I guess God could have created this world however he wanted to. And it didn't have to be that it was a man and a woman that came together and procreated. I mean, God could have designed this world however he wanted to. And yet in God's wisdom and masterful plan, it says male and female, he created them. Now, this, this idea of male and female, he created them, it's stated again in Genesis 5, verse 2. And it's even reaffirmed by Jesus himself in Matthew 19, 4 and Mark 10, 6. Male and female, he created them. Look over at Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2, verses 18 through 25. You have the man, he's created, Adam, and yet he's alone. Now, if you've ever read through Genesis 1, seven times there's this refrain... It was good. And the last time it says it was very good. And that's after the creation of mankind. It was good. 
It was good seven times. Everything's good that God created. And yet when you come to verse 18 of chapter 2, something is not good. The Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make, and notice this, a helper suitable for him. The right type of helper, the one that will be a complement to who he is. So now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. All these animals, and man, I love animals. And you know, we love our pets. But let me tell you, a pet, an animal, is not enough. The animal is not the helper, not the suitable helper that Adam needed. So you go on to read, it says, So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep, and while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. So again, Genesis 1, it was good, it was good, it was good. Everything God created was good. And yet God observed. Adam was alone, had all the animals and yet he was alone. He said, that's not good. That's not good. I need to rectify this. And so, were the animals enough? No. Had all the animals. We love animals. You love your animals. I love my animals. Animals are not the suitable helper for the man. And notice, he didn't create a fellow man. He didn't say, Adam, what you need is just a friend. What you need is another man that I'm going to create, and you all can be buddies, and that's what you need. No. He created a woman who was like the man, but who was different than the man. How many of you know there is a difference between a male and a female? Does anybody know that? I want to remind you of some differences. Females have two X chromosomes. Males have an X and a Y chromosome. I'm not even talking about theology today, my friend. I'm just talking about biology, and I'm talking about science. So this isn't something that you can say, well, that's just Pastor Mark's opinion. You're just up there preaching. I mean, this is just a scientific fact. Females have two X chromosomes, and males have an X and a Y chromosome. In terms of hormones, females have higher levels of estrogen, and males have higher levels of testosterone. Again, that's just, that's just a fact, my friend. Females and males are different. And I bet you didn't know this. Females can have children, but males can't. I don't know if you knew that. But females can become pregnant. There's no male ever has or will be able to become pregnant. They can't. It's a biological impossibility. Now, those are just a few differences. I didn't even mention their sexual anatomy. I mean, when we were having the ultrasound with Graham, the lady said, it's going to be a boy. I said, how do you know? She said, right there. <laughs> oh, yeah, I see it. Yeah, he is going to be a boy. I haven't even mentioned differences in their sexual anatomy, the sound of their voice. You think about a male's Adam's apple. You think about physical strength and bone mass. And then we could talk about relational and emotional differences. Any of you that are married, if you're a woman, you can say, man, men are a lot different than we women. And if you're a man, you can say, man, women are a lot different than men. And it's not different like a bad different. It's just we're different. And so that's just a fact. I want to say it's obvious and incontrovertible 
that there are biological differences between a male and a female. I mean, it's just, it's science. We know males are males and females are females. So in saying that, you might be thinking, well, why would anyone say that gender is self-chosen? I mean, it's just so clear. It's scientific. It's biological. Well, some would say that there's a difference between your anatomy and your gender. See, this is where, this is where people will go in a direction. So we're right here with science. We're right here with biology. But here's when they go in a direction. This is how they get around this. People today say, I'm not saying everyone, but people who would embrace the idea that you can self-identify as a male if you're a biological female, they would say there is a difference between your sexual anatomy and your gender. They would say there's a difference between your birth sex and the sex or the gender that you identify as a person as you grow up. So that's, where they, that's how they can say, well, they will say, yeah, well, of course, you know, biological males have an X and a Y chromosome. Of course, I mean, they're not going to just deny that and be like an ostrich and stick their head in the sand, they would say, yes, I, I realize females can only have children and males can't, but they would say, that's just anatomy. That's just your birth sex. That's just physiology. And they would put gender in a different category. And yet I believe, and I think you would believe, that our gender is actually rooted in our sexual anatomy. You can't separate the two. And yet many do. That's why you have these terms. Maybe you've heard of these terms, cisgender, transgender, non-binary. And maybe you know what these terms mean, maybe not. But again, these terms are only in existence because there's a belief that your gender is different from your birth sex. So a cisgender would be someone who identifies with the gender of their birth. So if you were born as a male and you identify as a male, they would say you're a cis gender, and that would be probably most of us here today, if not all of us. And then a transgender is someone who doesn't identify with the gender of their birth. So they're born biologically a male, but they identify as a female or vice versa. And then non-binary is someone who doesn't identify as either. They would say, I'm not a male, I'm not a female. And that's where, at least for me, it gets incredibly confusing because they don't want to use the pronoun he or she, but they. And if you've ever read an article about a non-binary person, man, I get so confused because they refer to them not as he, not as she, not as it, but they. And when I hear they, I cannot think but plural. And when you're reading about someone, again, maybe it's just me, but I get really, really confused so cisgender, transgender, non-binary, these terms are only in existence because of the belief not only that you can determine your own gender, but that gender is disconnected from your sexual anatomy. And yet again, I think most of us would believe, and I think it's been the belief of the majority of history, and I think it's the belief of the Bible that our gender is rooted in our sexual anatomy. You can't disconnect the two. Now, let me just say this. I do think there are cultural differences in how someone expresses their maleness or their femaleness. And I think that's where some of the confusion has come in. We've known this forever. I mean, we will talk about some girls as a tomboy, Right? Why? Because maybe she's more active than other girls. Maybe she likes to climb trees, and maybe she's just a little bit rougher than some of the other girls, and we say, oh, that's a tomboy. We're not saying she's a male. We still believe she's a female, but she's just expressing her femaleness, maybe in a different way. We've all known that there are some guys that aren't as masculine as other guys, and, you know, not every guy likes to go deer hunting, and not every guy is an outdoors guy or an athlete, but that doesn't mean that they're not a male. 
I think there are cultural differences in how you express your femaleness or how you express your maleness. That's in cultures. It can even be in the same culture, different individuals. But that, which I think we all would agree on, is a lot different than saying, I'm no longer a male, I'm a female, or I'm no longer a female, I'm now a male. So again, there are two genders, male and female. I think I want to share another point that's point two, and that is both of these genders are made in the image of God. I think that's important to stress, and I think the Bible stresses that. As we saw the word created used three times in verse 27, we see the phrase image of God three times in verses 26 through 28. It is stressed and emphasized that we are made in the image of God. And both genders are made in the image of God. Again, verse 27, male and female, he created them. They're both made in the image of God. It's not just the male is made in the image of God. The female is made in the image of God. Now, when we talk about an image, what this is saying is that we are not God, but we are like God. That's the emphasis. He didn't make us gods, but we are like God. We're not God, but we're like God. And in the ancient world, in particular, like Egypt and Mesopotamia, they believed that the king was the image of God. He was the representative of God or the gods. But the common person, oh, you're not in the image of God. That's the king. That's the royal leadership of our country or our nation. And this is what's so powerful about this text. If you don't know that background, that's what's so powerful about this text. Because in that day, in that world, they didn't think everybody was made in the image of God or in the image of the gods. It was the royal figures. It was the powerful figures. It was the king. And here is Moses saying, no, it's everyone. Everyone is made in the image of God. And not just the males, but the females too, equally made in the image of God. That's a leveling. That's a powerful statement. And so when you think about genders, we're both made in the image of God, you say, well, what does it mean to be made in the image of God? Well, we're like God, but we're not God. And scholars, philosophers, theologians, Bible commentators have struggled and wrestled with what does it mean to be made in the image of God? And so let me try to break it down to you in this, in this sentence. I think the image of God means this. We represent God in a unique way, and we can relate to God in a unique way. I think that's what it means to be made in the image of God. We represent God in a unique way, and we can relate to God in a unique way. You represent God in this world. It says, be fruitful and multiply, multiply fill the earth, and rule over the fish of the sea. Rule over the birds of the air. You are the representative of God. You are to carry out the will of God and the bidding of God in a way unlike any other creature. And even says, fill the earth. Again, that emphasizes two genders because two men cannot multiply and fill the earth. Two women cannot multiply and fill the earth, but a man and a woman can. They can procreate. And so when you think about this idea of gender, both genders are made in the image of God. And we represent God, but also we can relate to God in a unique way. Because of our conscience, because of our rationality, because of our will, because of our ability to speak in language, we can relate to God in a unique way. Now, I've been around dogs all my life. When I grew up, we had several dogs. I had a dog that I had for almost 14 years named Sweetie, and I loved her to death. Had to bury her. We buried her out at Camp Lebanon a couple years ago. We now have a dog named Shadow, and he's a great dog too. He's more Jenny's dog than he is my dog. But I love dogs. And let me tell you, dogs are amazing animals, and dogs are probably my favorite animals, but I can tell you this. I've never seen a dog pray. 
I've never seen a dog get down on its hands and knees or its hands and paws and say, Heavenly Father, I come to you today and I pray that my masters will feed me good and I pray that I'll be kept safe from any ticks or fleas and I pray you'll watch over me and bless me with a good life. I've never seen a dog pray. I've never seen a dog speak in language. I've never seen it. My dog has no personal relationship with God. Zero. Now, you might say, well, but my dog does. <laughs> no, it doesn't. That's like the pastor who had a dog that was not very well behaved, and its name was Bandit. And someone once asked, do you believe all dogs go to heaven? He said, I don't know, but I believe Bandit's going to the other place. <laughs> well, listen, we love our pets. We love our dogs. Maybe it's a cat. But it can't have a personal relationship with God. They live on instinct and repeated behavior. It's, it's an animal. We're not animals in that way. We are creatures made in the image of God. You can pray. You can hear God's voice. You can communicate with God. You can talk to God. God can talk to you. You're held accountable for your behavior in a moral way. What's morality to an animal? I mean, right now, you think about lions and all wild animals. I mean, they're killing each other and mating with different, you know, not just one, you know, one, but multiple, you know, multiple females. They don't think about morality. We do. Morality is connected to being made in the image of God. Again, so much of this goes back to creation. I'm trying to help you to see, kind of pull back the curtain and see why our world is the way it is today. When you move away from creation, when you move away from the image of God, what is the basis of morality? Well, it's what I think, it's what you think, it's what the government says, it's what it's... That's what morality is. Once you remove God and the creative work of God, there is no basis for morality. And so that's why you have all of these different beliefs and different ideas. But male and female, both made in the image of God, both equally made in the image of God. And that's why any inferiority between a male and a female is not from God. It's not. We're both created in the image of God. God loves a female just as much as he loves a male. And some of this push towards this gender identification is because in the history of the world, many times males have dominated females in a way that's been inappropriate, in a way that's been domineering. And so that's why some of this has come about. But we believe that the female is equally made in the image of God. She, too, can have a personal relationship with God, and she can know the Lord and be known by the Lord, which causes me to say, if you are a female, embrace that and celebrate that. I mean, I'm so thankful for women. And if you're a woman, don't, don't be like, well, man, I wish I was a man. Be thankful that you're a woman. That's who God made you. And if you're a man, be thankful that you're a man and celebrate that. You should celebrate if you're a woman and you should celebrate if you're a man. Well, one last point I want to share, and I've already been emphasizing it, but I just want to spell it out very clearly to you. God makes you male or female. It's not self-chosen. It's God-given. God makes you male or female. You know, what we live in today is a radical form of self-determination. It's a radical form of self-determination, and it's a false view of freedom is what we live in today. I can declare myself this. I can declare myself that disconnected to who I am biologically and who I am via creation. And so when you think about this radical form of self-determination and freedom, it's not only I can do whatever I want to do, I can be whatever I want to be. And let me tell you, not all freedom is God-given freedom. 
There's a lot of spurious freedom. There's a lot of false freedom out there. It looks like freedom, but it's not. In Genesis chapter 2, verses 15 through 17, it says, The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man... Now notice this. We look at this as a restriction. God looked at it as abundance. You are free to eat from any tree in the garden. What's the emphasis? The emphasis was not on you can't do this and you can't do that. You know, we think of God as you can't, you can't, you can't, you can't. Well, I read this passage. To me, this is God saying you have all kinds of freedom. You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. What's the emphasis? Free, free, free. You are free to eat any tree, any fruit. You're free. Just don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. What was the tree of the knowledge and good of good and evil? It, it's, it's hard really to know for sure. And kind of like the image of God Scholars and theologians and Bible commentators and philosophers have wrestled with what is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Well, Victor Hamilton, who wrote a two-part commentary on Genesis, an amazing commentary. He was one of my professors at Asbury College. I think he hits the nail on the head. He says the tree of the knowledge of good and evil stands for moral autonomy. Moral autonomy. The knowledge, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is eating of it and saying, I determine what is good and I determine what is evil. It's not God says this is good and God says this is evil. No, I want to determine what is good and I want to determine what is evil. Victor Hamilton writes, one might then suggest that the knowledge of good and evil is moral autonomy. In deciding for themselves what is good and proper and what is not, the couple are making themselves the final moral authority for their lives and in a diabolical way becoming their own God. That's what is so concerning about all of this. You have God who is the creator. You have God who is the fountain and the establisher of good and evil. He's the one who says this is good. He is the one who says this is evil. And yet we, by eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, we are setting ourselves up that we embrace moral autonomy. Moral autonomy means I decide morality. Not you, not God, me. I decide what's right and what's wrong. And it's, it, it's not only that. Now, this message today, I think most of you, if not all of you, would say that's biblical and that is good because it's from God. But there are a lot of people today that would say this is hateful and evil and bigoted, what I've shared here today. So it's not only, well, this is, this is okay, but now what we thought was okay is now wrong. It's evil. It's bad. It's hurtful. That's eating of the the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, this moral autonomy that I set myself up as the moral judge of what's right and what's wrong. And when you do that, it's a rejection of God as creator. Amen. It's a rejection. I remember reading a little book by E. Stanley Jones called Abundant Living, and he was talking about freedom and how God is the giver of freedom. And you even think about that verse. Again, I just want to emphasize, you are free to eat whatever tree you want to. I mean, that's, the emphasis was on the freedom, not the restriction. But E. Stanley Jones says there's a lot of false freedom out there, people who think they're free, but they're really in bondage. And he compared it to a train. And you think about a train, if you've ever been on a train, it's, it's kind of cool and exciting to ride on that train. It can go really fast, and you can see the scenery. It can take you from one place to another quickly. And before airplanes, I mean, trains were it. I mean, that's if you really wanted to travel fast, I mean, you got on a train. But you think about a train. 
if they want to fulfill their purpose, if they want to really shine, they're on the rails, right? They're on the tracks. But what if the train says, well, I want to be free. I don't want to be restricted by these rails any longer. I don't want to be restricted by these tracks any longer. I'm going to embrace moral autonomy. I'm going to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I'm coming off those tracks. I'm free. You're not free. You're stuck. And you're broken. And if people want to call that freedom, I want to tell you, that's not freedom. A train was made a certain way, and its freedom is found in being who it was made to be. A, a train is free on the rails, on the tracks, and when it's on the, on the rails, man, it is powerful. You don't want to get in front of a locomotive. But if it says, I'm tired of being a train, and I'm going to, you know, declare myself something other than a train... And I don't want to be on the tracks anymore. If it gets off, it's not free. And I think a lot of people have gotten off the tracks and they want to say, I'm free. That's not freedom, my friend. Freedom is found when you embrace who God made you to be, not who you say you are, but who God says you are. And that's part of even salvation. You come to the Lord saying, tell me who I am. I didn't know who I was until I became a follower of Jesus Christ. I didn't understand I'm made in the image of God. I'm loved by God. I have a purpose. God had gifted me to teach and preach his gospel. I didn't know any of that until I came to the Lord, and he not only told me who he was, he told me who I was. Isn't that beautiful? When you become a follower of Jesus, it's not just Jesus tells you who he is. He tells you who you are. And that's liberating because maybe you've been told things and you're this and you're that or you're a nobody or nobody loves you and you wonder sometimes if, if certain people get off the tracks because of maybe how they've been treated and embracing ideas and teachings that are not from God. But that's not the way. The way is to come to the Lord and let him not only tell you who he is, but let him tell you who you are and embrace who you are. Because when you're who you are, that's when you're free. The person that God made you to be. And so I know that all of you here today, you were made by God. You were made like God. You're different from the animals. We respect, we love animals, we treat them nicely. But an animal is not the same as a human being made in the image of God. Jesus didn't die for the animals Jesus didn't even die for the angels. Jesus died for human beings made in the image of God. He died for you. And if you're here today and you are confused, and you know, we live in a confusing world. I, I, I have compassion for our young people because they're raised and taught things that we weren't taught, and they can get so confused in their mind, and we need to love them. We do need to love them. We need to pray for them, and we need to let them know it's not me telling you who you are, and it's not you telling yourself who you are. It's God. But it's the God who made you. It's the God who loved you, and it's the God who can give you a fulfillment. You think you're embracing fulfillment. You think you're embracing freedom. Only God can give that. And maybe you're here today, and you want that. You want to know the Lord, and you want to experience that freedom. I invite you to come forward if you do. Would you go ahead and stand with me this morning? Made in the image of God, loved by God, created by God, and we can have a personal relationship with God. That's part of what it means to be in the image of God. You can relate to God in a unique way. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, I invite you to come. Uh, the altar to my right and left, we have people who will come and pray with you today if you need prayer. And if you want to just pray by yourself or maybe with a family member or friend, you can come to these front altars, whatever the need is. And, you know, as I say at times, maybe it's something not even related to the message. You know, maybe you came here today with a burden, a struggle, and the message is not related to that. But maybe a song was. 
or maybe you just came with that struggle or that burden and you need prayer, we want to pray for you about whatever you want prayer about, whether it's physical healing, salvation, maybe you have children you want to come and pray for, whatever the situation is, grandchildren. Maybe you just want to pray for our nation. Maybe you just want to come and say, man, we live in such a complicated, confusing time, and it just seems to be getting worse and worse and worse, and we just want to let the light of God shine down upon us. Maybe you want to come and pray for our land. We welcome that. Father, as persons come today to pray and seek your face, we thank you, Lord, that we have a compass. We have an anchor. We have a light. Lord, I don't know what we would do without the Bible. Lord, if we throw the Bible out, we throw creation out, we throw God out, we embrace this moral autonomy that we are the dictators and the deciders of what is right and wrong. Lord, that's always going to end in a dead-end street. But Lord, you... I know in my own life, you not only told me who you were, but you told me who I am. And so to speak, I'm comfortable in my own skin, not because I'm perfect or better than anyone else, but I'm who you made me to be. I don't want to be anyone else. I don't want to be a female. I don't want to be another male. I want to be Mark Jackson because that's who you made me to be. And I hope everybody here today feels that way that they are who you made them to be. And they would accept that and shine in that and glorify you, made in the image and likeness of God. Lord, we just pray that you would bless this time of response. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us today for Town Church Online. We pray you've been blessed, encouraged, and even challenged by today's message. If you would like to respond in any way, maybe you'd like to give your heart to Jesus. Maybe you have a prayer request you'd like to share, or you'd like to just check in and let us know how you're doing. You can go to our website at town.church slash connect and fill out our online connect card there. Also, if you'd like to give to Town Church to support the continuing ministry here in our area and beyond, go to our website at town.church slash invest and you can give of your tithes and offerings there. Make sure to like, subscribe, or to follow uh, so you can get these messages each time they come on. You can find the, the links there in the description of this video. Until we're able to see each other again, we pray you be blessed.